Welcome everybody, good evening and thank you for coming to Chatham House. Um, <coughs> needless to say, we're on the record this evening um, and uh, you may tweet to your heart's content, so, all good. I'm James Nixie, but more importantly I'm joined by a trio of outstanding Russian Russia analysts. Um, I say Russian, but I know that Gulnes is half American. Um, but perhaps let me say first of all, by way of introduction, that I do feel that we are all worse off these days poorer Russia analysts in, in every sense because of, well, we can't go there, we can't meet people, we can't interview, meet people nice, not so nice. Um, and that, I, I do feel the loss. Um, and I suppose for most people, it is you know, those people who are able to travel to Russia and one may treat some of them with a great deal of skepticism. That said, um, that's why it is to me, and I hope this doesn't sound like a contradiction, it is all the more important that we do listen to Russians, uh, exiled Russians, the exile community, obviously massively um, burgeoned, increased in the last couple of years by force. Um, uh, and, I, and I do think that their insight is, is usefully different. I won't say better because Ben Noble, if he's listening, will kill me, but, um, but, but certainly I think they bring a unique dimension to it. We have plenty of discussions inside the Russian Eurasia program at Chatham House um, with Russians, and we used to feel this just adds to our, um, adds to our analysis and our depth. Um, so, um, that's a plan, and this evening we have in reverse order, Gulnaz Sharaf Dudinova from King's College London, uh, Yulia Minieva, actually at Chatham House, our new generation Europe fellow, uh, and Maxim Alyukov uh, from Manchester and King's. And I will ask a few questions uh, and then open it out to the audience online and in this hall. So, I think I would agree that I'll start with you, Maxime. Thank you for coming. Um, you'll notice that I haven't yet referenced the event happening on, uh, in mid-March uh, of this year. And of course, we make fun of it, and there's going to be lots of um, satire and cartoons and jokes, and rightly so. But I guess I've always taken the, had the belief that um, the, the vote, the election, um, that it tells us quite a lot about how Russia is governed. So, that's my question. What does it tell us about what the Russians need to do? It's sort of paddling under the water, the duck under the water. What do they need to do to maintain the illusion? Um, what is it? Why do they have it? All of that. So why, why is it important to them? Um, and what does it tell us about Russian society today? Uh, well, yeah, uh, in order to understand the regime approach to voting an election, upcoming election, uh, I think it's important to understand uh, its approach to maintaining stability in general. Because uh, in any authoritarian country, you have a regime which typically rests on fear, lies, or economic prosperity. And this formula very well describes how Russia evolved in the past uh, two decades, right? So from the 2000s, when the regime relied more on economic prosperity and low intensity propaganda and violence, to 2010s, uh, to economic decline and uh, medium intensity propaganda and violence. And finally, the invasion of Ukraine uh, was a very important point uh, because uh, basically the economic prosperity now is out of the question. Uh, and you see a shift towards uh, much more uh, intensive use of violence and propaganda. And even given an extremely sophisticated propaganda machine in contemporary Russia, I would say that violence is still more important because it allowed the regime to uh, basically neutralize all the most important opponents, uh, raise the cost of protest for, for the public, and also demolish all organizational infrastructure which could, be, could have been used to translate this content into action. And this creates, uh, this is how the regime maintains stability, but not without tensions, right? So there are still tensions, and I would say that the major tension right now is between uh, a desire for some kind of uh, stability and normalization on the one hand, and the decision to continue the war on the other, right? So uh, on the one hand, uh, one hand, we see the abundance of data, for instance, surveys showing, repeatedly showing that people are uh, dissatisfied with economic outcomes. Uh, there is the majority of Russians who would like to see some kind of negotiations and peace. So it's not really peace, I mean, peace, uh, quote unquote peace, because for, for different people, this peace uh, means different things. So for some, it would be uh, negotiations, but keeping some Ukrainian territories. Uh, for there's negotiations but keeping Crimea, but still some kind of uh, stabilization and there is the sense of uh, tiredness uh, related to the protracted conflict. And this sets out, sets sort of the context for the upcoming election because that's the, ten uh, the, the tension uh, the regime has to address somehow. Uh, and uh, of course, Putin himself um, 
uh, sort of is preparing for the election. Uh, the campaign itself is uh, almost non-existent. We don't see him addressing the public. Uh, but these rare opportunities he had, uh, he used to basically say that the economy is doing great and uh, the war is not going to end uh, at the same time, which is a trade-off. So, so he basically ignores this trade-off uh, while these ideas are clearly in contradiction. Uh, and at the same time, we see uh, some level of political apathy. So even among regime supporters, uh, you see that uh, uh, the election is of very, interest, uh, of very little interest for voters. Uh, they understand that it's meaningless. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to participate in it. So it creates a problem for the presidential administration. So they are aware of this uh, discontent on the one hand and uh, probably little interest on the other. Uh, but at the same time, there are sources within the Kremlin uh, who say that uh, they were instructed to provide a landslide uh, electoral victory with uh, uh, water turnout of 70 to 80 percent. Uh, and in this context, they will obviously uh, have to rely on uh, a very sophisticated system of fraud. Uh, which have been honed over the past years, right? So the uh, new system of electronic voting, uh, uh, election lasting several days, uh, uh, and of course massive, tremendous use of uh, administrative resource to force uh, state-dependent workers to vote. So I think right now it's mostly a system uh, dependent on, on violence rather than on persuasion and legitimacy. Uh, yeah, it of course does not mean uh, this approach allows the regime to effectively maintain stability, but it's also important that the reliance of violence uh, generates a much higher degree of uncertainty than reliance of legitimate uh, consent. So the more system is not transparent and the more it's governed by violence rather than by rules, uh, the more difficult it's to uh, make predictions about stability or evolution, uh, so it might change at some point. Thank you very much indeed. Can I just follow you up before, before, I, before I turn to Yulia? Just a, just a quick follow up. What's the balance of um, pre voting manipulation and post voting manipulation? In other words, obviously they prepare the population um, in all sorts of ways, but ultimately there is, you know, it's not the votes, but it's the counters, as they say. Um, so, what's the, uh, how, what's the, no, whether it's a ratio or however you want to say it, but I mean, ultimately, it's, it's, they have to do it both, both, both sides of voting day, they have to do it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So I would say yeah, by pre-voting manipulation, you mean uh, like forcing people to vote? Everything, whatever. Yeah. I think it's more important than post-voting falsification because no. okay. uh, uh, you have this very sophisticated machine uh, which is designed to provide uh, the desired result. Uh, and then when uh, you provide some, some numbers and you see that you do not get the desired result, then post factum you can change something, falsify. Uh, but the most important part happens uh, before and during the election. Just one final thing, I can't help myself. Um, thought experiment. If Russia were to hold a genuinely free and fair election, what would that look like? <laughs> uh, it's quite difficult to imagine, yeah. Yes, it is. it is hard to imagine, but a thought experiment, absolutely. Yeah, well, uh, by a fair if, election... If there were to be no what I mean is if there, were to be no, if there were to be no manipulation. Yeah, yeah, well, if you mean no manipulation from the very beginning, right, so different candidates are allowed to run and gather support, uh, then, uh, yeah, I think it can be quite chaotic process with many people participating. Okay, so you can't give an answer, but you can say it'll result in chaos. Okay, that's interesting in itself. Yulia, can I turn to you? So, um, so I've got two things for you. Um, first is I'd like to talk a little bit about elites, if you wouldn't mind. Who's in, out, up, down, what might happen in a post, what might happen with the elites after the election, if that's any kind of watershed. So I'd love you to say a little bit about that. And, um, and it, it's just you know, for the audience here, I mean, your research here is about reaching back in the Russian diaspora, the new Russian diaspora, as I, as we, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit, frankly, about your research here. I think that would be interesting to people. Um, and what effects they are having, what motivations they have. Um, I, they're, 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 they're not a monolith by any stretch of the imagination. So something about their, their di the, the diversity of the diaspora. Yeah. Please. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we are talking here before the Russian elections. And even though we already know the results, um, in the run-up to any elections, even the one that we see in Russia, there is usually tension in the air among the elites. 
And so despite the fact that we haven't seen any major reshuffles um, since 2020, when Mikhail Mishustin was appointed uh, a prime minister, the new presidential term is usually kind of associated with reappointments or maybe some uh, major reforms. And also some of the, just a technical thing, that some of the contracts of um, ministers or people from presidential administration, they're also kind of tied up to, to, the, to the presidential term. So in this sense, it's impossible to predict whether these contracts will be prolonged, let's say. So there is a little bit of uh, room for intrigue and, um, and some speculations. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, in the end of 2022, a lot of experts were saying that in 2023, we are expecting some, so the year is going to be marked by repressions against, the, against some members of elite. And uh, that would make sense because it would, on one hand, allow to show the population that there is a, like a scapegoat uh, that we can blame for our failures um, in war. And at the same time, it would be a sign for elites that there, will, there is no place for dissent or criticism anymore. But at the same time, we haven't seen much arrest that may suggest that actually the stability for the regime at the moment is uh, more important than that is renewal. At the same time, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't expect any renewals in the elite. Uh, quite recently, uh, last week, the President Putin, uh, during his speech, said that the word elite um, by which he meant those who got their fortune um, in the 90s in Russia has discredited itself. And the new elite of Russia should be those fighting in Ukraine. And it's them who should take the ministerial and some high positions in the government or in different like social and state services. Uh, so by saying that, Putin also sends kind of two signals. First, for the population, that the special, so-called special military operation is the main social lift in the country. And the second is probably to the elite, that the old elite, meaning the, the top of Russian Forbes, basically, um, are at risk now and shouldn't take their privilege uh, for granted. So what we see these days is it's not the arrests, actually, but rather the revision of uh, the privatization seems to be the main instrument of uh, elite management in um, in current Russia these days. And as Transparency reported today, there was around 180 companies that are now being nationalized uh, by the government. And not all of them are defense related. And so they're probably gonna be taken, like passed to, to some competitors. Or maybe they're gonna be passed to this emerging new class of Russian establishment, basically people who um, took over the control of um, Western assets in Russia. So I would say that for business, the recipe um, of how to survive in Russia, the rules are it's basically not to be too bold, not to compare about sanctions, and if you can, uh, publicly support what's going on in the country, but not many people are doing that because of obvious sanction risks. Um, so basically, I feel like the idea of uh, the formation of this new elite from those who fought in Ukraine looks much more interesting because this elite is basically just brutal and uh, loyal to people, to, to Putin, military um, servicemen, would just naturally conclude the, the process of so-called Siloviki state. But at the same time, there is a risk uh, because they are now trying to second guess what Putin wants. And usually such executives, let's say, they can go too far and actually harm the regime by maybe creating some black swans that the government will have to deal with. Fascinating. Um, and I've got, I'd love to follow up, but I did ask about diaspora. What are you, in, yeah. in, in your research? So, what, what's your question about, what's the question about Ooh. diaspora? Uh, How they reach back in, what their motivations are, what they want, what they... Um, so, at the moment, it, it's hard to count, but at the moment it's said that there is about 500,000 or to 1.3 million of Russians uh, who left the country after the full-scale invasion, and for for complex reasons. 
And during the, these two years in emigration, Russians have managed to create more than 100 um, grassroots initiative projects that is uh, mostly trying to aggregate resources and uh, work directly with Russian populations. Uh, there are many kind of avenues they're working on, but I would say uh, first is like journalists and projects that are fighting um, propaganda. The other kind of lag is uh, people who are helping Russians on the ground. I don't know, like let's say it's lawyers who help to who help Russians to avoid military service or defend their rights if they were fired for their anti-war stance. Um, let's say there are sociologists who are trying new different methods to actually measure the sentiment in Russia, like IT specialists who are trying to circumvent the, the Iron Curtain and so on. Um, in terms of opposition political actors, obviously we're going to touch on Navalny here. Um, I would say there are mostly now, not the leaders of opposition, but the leaders of opinion, and they're usually communicating with their audience through YouTube and social media. Uh, but unfortunately, this category is quite divided, and at the moment is a bit important. So I feel like with the, with the death of Navalny, there is a window of opportunity for, 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 for the opposition to kind of rectify the situation. That makes sense. It does make sense. Interesting. I'm sure we'll get into you know, the, the perennial question of whatever happened to the Russian opposition um, in the question discussion session. But for now, let me move to Gulnaz. A um, couple of things, Gulnaz. First of all, um, <clears throat> maybe you'd like to comment on that and see uh, in the sense that have you noticed any changes in Russian government strategy? I mean, this is, this is an election, um, the first real wartime election we've had in Russia. Um, so what changes have you seen there? And then I'd also like to take you back to what, what I know your real expertise is, which is in um, <clears throat> city-province divides. Um, we, we often hear about it, you know, that they're different. I often wonder if it's over-egged, but you can tell us, you can tell us um, in terms of uh, viewpoints, um, who's being mobilised, um, in terms of support for the regime, what the differences are there between the cities um, and, and the countryside, effectively. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, James. Hello, everyone. So um, on the issue of the changing strategies, um, I think, of course, the Russian government, the Kremlin, had to adapt and think about adapting and adjusting to the new context of war. But the adaptation uh, kept the same principles in mind and was more of the same in terms of ensuring control uh, of governance structures and predictability of political outcomes especially the electoral outcomes. And, but this orientation towards control and predictability have been there for the past uh, two decades and more. And um, how uh, this adaptation happens and how they ensure control and predictability in war situation differs somewhat given the sanctions regime, the shock on the economy, the psychological shock on the society and the need to reorient uh, economic development uh, strategies. And of course, it's not about economic development strategies anymore. It's about uh, ensuring that uh, the economy doesn't collapse. And of course, uh, uh, at, at the beginning uh, of unprecedented sanctions, um, the expectations of uh, most analysts, of many analysts, was um, that there will be an incredible contraction of the Russian economy. Um, that did not happen, and um, that, that created a big puzzle for why it didn't happen. And um, very respectable analysts, political economists, economists are uh, coming up with their explanations, um, one of which that I um, uh, <coughs> agree with that resonates um, is how you know, Russian economy has been going through a number of different crises and adjusting, uh, learning to adjust to the sanctions regime in 2014, learning to adjust and adapt to um, COVID uh, crisis and economic actors with many market actors had to adjust and the crisis focus crisis context is not a new one in post-2022. And so many of those mechanisms were worked out. Uh, many of those mechanisms uh, were based on sort of mutual uh, communication and coordination between market actors and, and government officials. And these mechanisms 
proved resilient in this um, uh, new uh, shock as well. Uh, but of course, besides that, the flexibility of Russian economy is uh, also, and, and why I'm talking about flexibility of Russian economy, of course, this is the very basic structural important element for you know, adjusting your governance strategy for maintaining stability and control and predictability of political outcomes. And of course, we need to bring um, into account, and again, something that uh, Putin was very much pounding on in his federal address was how the global or world economy is changing in terms of its structure and how the Western role in the global economy and the global GDP is going down and, and the rise of the um, Asian countries and, and the BRICS and, and China and India and Brazil and, and others uh, in, as a share of global GDP is rising. And so to the extent that the sanctions um, uh, are coming from the West, but not from China, not from Turkey, not from, from India, uh, that creates a big leeway for readjustment of imports and exports. And therefore, we do see this gradual readjustment happening. And um, therefore, enabling the Kremlin to maintain um, uh, not economic prosperity and development, but um, economic stability that might be losing the dynamism and might be going down slowly, or in comparison to economic crisis in, in, in Western countries, might allow even the opportunity for um, the propaganda uh, and opinion leaders in Russia to suggest that, look, Russian economy is growing. And indeed, in 2023, uh, the uh, economy has sort of overshoot in terms of predicted uh, GDP rise. And so, um, you know, the, uh, that, 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 that helps. And of course, putting um, incredible resources into the <coughs> military production is what drives some of this industrial and manufacturing growth. And, um, you know, it could be discussed in terms of how long it could be uh, maintained and, and how, where is it going to, and in the long term, whether this is a sustainable strategy at all, you know, probably not. Uh, but in the short term, it works to pacify uh, population. It, it works to give psychological and cognitive resources to people to suggest that we're doing all right here and we are recognized by many other countries than the West and we are taking advantage of sanctions to develop our many sectors of the economy and substitute imports. And when people are looking for such justifications because they do not have choices to exit, to go into exile, to leave and use their talents and skills in other countries, they look for those justifications and they are given. And plus, maybe the final big resource that's given out is not symbolic and not propaganda, but actually social benefits, payments to families with children, to pensioners, sort of a very uh, attentive um, policy towards adjusting the payments uh, uh, with the inflation or beyond the inflation and doing this especially in the months coming up to, uh, to the election and announcing a lot of attention and announcing a lot of social projects to develop you know, schools and, and um, uh, families with children and, and youth and um, mortgages and housing and construction. And so, so that gives uh, from, from, from the government's perspective, a sense to the population that, that things are d going not so bad as people expected uh, uh, in, the sh in the situation of the shock. So there is a lot of this uh, PR, of course, that's, that's going on. But in terms of coming back to the government strategy, um, it is adapting to the situation, both economically in terms of, um, but, but in a way the whole strategy of the West as an enemy, the strategy of uh, focusing on social, um, uh, on social benefits issues uh, and uh, sort of combining economic and propagandistic um, uh, narratives and discourses uh, has stayed the same, hasn't changed in dramatic fashion. Very interesting. Um, a little bit more about the, the city uh, rural divide. Yes. So in 2011, Natalia Zubarevich offered this very um, useful idea concept of Russia consisting of, uh, that there is no one Russia, but there are four Russias, where um, she really juxtaposed the social 
development levels and therefore political leanings of urbanites who live in very big cities versus those who live in smaller cities, more industrial. Uh, and at that moment in 2011, uh, there was no industrial push, but there was more of a uh, stagnation type uh, tendency starting, and then the very small rural and very small towns, so under 50,000, and then the very marginalized and uh, poor regions in the Caucasus and and few others in, in Siberia in the Far East, and so 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 basically suggesting that uh, the because of the political structure, because of the economic structures, uh, the the social development and political orientation are really really different. Since then, right, we are now 13 years after, after that argument, uh, what do we see? We, we you know, the, probably that argument doesn't apply anymore. And, um, uh, you know, 1.3 million that uh, Yulia mentioned have left are sort of young, most skilled, most talented, most resourceful, most cosmopolitan, most Western oriented most um, educated and sort of the promise for Russia's future development uh, uh, is, is not there anymore. Uh, and still, uh, even with the shifts that have happened over the past 10 years, which have not been for the good of social development in Russia, we still, of course, see the rivers of urbanites in Moscow going to uh, Borisovsk Cemetery. Um, and we do not necessarily um, see a very widespread attitudes of that nature of support for Navalny in many other smaller cities in Russia. And hence, there is, there is a difference that, that, that is still there in terms of, um, sort of adaptation strategies, depoliticization, and uh, that, that works for um, uh, many people who, um, uh, who who live in an environment that is different from Moscow environment that has gone in the direction of Moscow, St. Petersburg, other uh, cities with million and more population that have gone in, in the direction of more sort of post-industrial, more cosmopolitan uh, uh, direction. And um, so, so there is a big divide there. And, and in that sense, society is fragmented in terms of their attitudes towards Putin and the system in terms of their attitudes towards the West, in terms of their willingness to, 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 to have an active civic uh, position. And um, that divide, um, you know, I don't want to overestimate it, but I think it shouldn't be underestimated either because these, especially given a very strong now educational uh, propagandistic efforts from the regime side to raise children in specific um, views and in specific patriotic uh, discourses, uh, that, that, that divide unfortunately might not go in favor of, again, the rivers of people who mourn Navalny and who represent and whom many people in the West have, I think it's resonated a lot and gave hope. Um, so I think the reality is, uh, is difficult and complex and, and I don't want to take any position, whether not a pessimistic position to suggest that, that you know, this, this, the, the, the people that we saw in the past days um, is, is really minority. Um, but I think coming back to a very important question of what would have happened if elections were taken in a free and competitive environment. And so the environment, the context is really important. We saw a glimpse of what might have happened with people voting and not voting, but signing for Nadezhdin. And this happened in the absence of free media, in the absence of open channels of communication, right? And now imagine if these channels of communication open up, how long will it take for, um, bringing the more depoliticized population uh, uh, you know, into, into, into more progressive politics um, is a question, but I think those shifts could happen quite quickly and dramatically if the context changes. Therefore, I wouldn't go in the direction of focusing on you know, 
some, I don't know, some deep-rooted mentality of individuals, etc. But I would talk about the importance of context, about the importance of structures, structures of propaganda, structures of incentives that individuals face. And in the shift of these structures and the environment, um, I think people could change their behavior and their attitudes and their political preferences too. So if we saw thousands standing up because of the anti-war stance of Nadezhdin, imagine if the media structures and information flows were different, how it might have affected the results. And we saw that Nadezhdin was not allowed to run, and so that shows uh, that the Kremlin is worried that if Nadezhdin was allowed to run, what that it might have been a little too competitive for the Kremlin even in the absence of all the structures that would allow for the creation of civil society and public opinion that we can talk about public opinion that exists in a different environment. Because what we call now public opinion in Russia, it's not public opinion. I think that's right, Gulnas, but, but Nadezhdin was just getting a little bit too popular for comfort. Um, probably Navalny too, in a different sense. I mean, it shows the extreme sensitivity of a regime, but they can't, even in the, the tightly controlled conditions that they have, they can't allow a Navalny, they can't allow a Nadezhdin in the different ways. One thing that's, um, thank you very much, by the way. One thing that has um, struck me in what, a, what all three of you have said is, is actually the degree of resilience that Russia has, where its ability to, to change, adapt, regenerate, you were saying, Yulia. Um, I mean, my colleague, Arisi Lutsevich, in the front row works on Ukraine's resilience, and we talk about that a lot, and rightly so, and important to bolster it. But there is, and it's not just confined to Russia, but there is a great deal of, of autocratic resilience, if you like, or resilience amongst aut autocracies. Um, and I think we underestimate that. We've been predicting the end of a Russian regime, I think, since 2007, if I'm not mistaken. You can pick your own date. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and I think we... Whilst obviously you can, there is a mistake in considering Russia to be 10 foot tall, over egging, overestimating Russia's strengths, then I think we also underestimate its ability to survive, regenerate, change, adapt. Um, and that's probably an analytical fa failure on, on, on many of our parts. I just, before, before I go, um, there's half an hour left already only, but I just can't help com coming back to the issue of violence. Um, Maxime, but anybody really, I mean, I don't want to put it as bluntly as this, but it works, right? I mean, I mean, so I mean, ser seriously. I mean, uh, do you think? I mean, the regime must think it works, and therefore, can we assume that if the regime thinks it works, then in the, the slightly more, uh, in a in a post-election situation, in order to maintain control, that it will resort to more and greater violence? Uh, well, I think the regime will resort to more and more violence just because this is how uh, repression works, right? So there are many, mm -hmm. for instance, theories about why uh, and how repressions continue, uh, right? So give more power to Siloviki, mm -hmm. and they implement repressions, and their importance for the government is, increases, and that's why they uh, exagger exaggerate threats and that's why the government gives them even more power. So there's no way it's like a repression trap. Uh, when you set on this course, uh, it's gonna continue and it's going to increase. Any thoughts on violence? I mean, Yulia, you've been in Russia since, you were in Russia, you know, I, I remember during the, the protests in 2011. Uh, were you at Balatnaya? I can't remember, Yulia. In, in Balatnaya Square, I can't remember. But um, no, were, I wasn't there, I uh, had my exams in the university. But you have, you have, you have, been associated with the with opposition movements. You know the people. You've interviewed them. I mean, what's your sense of uh, the Russian regime's resort to violence? Um, I mean, it's not going to be something new to say that it's easier to to reign through fear rather than through love. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, I mean. It works, and but the thing that we've seen uh, with uh, Navalny's funeral, uh, that so many people actually came knowing how much risks it actually carries, uh, was actually really impressive because, like, let's say in a lot of independent media as well, um, they were publishing instructions, like, if you want to go to Navalny's funeral, this is what you should be 
this is what you should know, this is what you should do if you get arrested and so on. And at the same time, um, Navalny actually gathered one of the biggest protests um, with, with, with his funeral. Mm -hmm. And that's really impressive that mm -hmm. how many people actually not scared of that and decided to go out. Uh, now we see that, um, as were predicted a bit, that they are now arresting some of those who participated in that, just because it was a question like how Russian authorities would actually let such thing happen. So many people gather in Moscow to commemorate Navalny. But now this, we see that some of them are being arrested and it's probably for the purpose to teach um, the rest of those who actually went to that process, saying like, probably, you know, it was one of the last opportunities for you <coughs> to do so. So yeah, I feel like there's gonna be some, um, probably some, even some public criminal cases and like trials um, for those yeah. who actually came to I do say goodbye so, to yeah. the money. Gulnaz, any thoughts on the regime's comfortableness with violence, its attitude to violence? Comfortable with? How comfort? How, how, how comforted? Is it, uh, oh, comforted. Uh, how, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, what I mean is, do you, uh, uh, any any thoughts on on how at ease is how how it uses violence with impunity? How how it, it doesn't so, it doesn't it doesn't how it doesn't shirk away from it. it. Yeah. Let me talk about the effects of violence, which I think are very important and which we have seen specifically in rise um, over the past year or two. Uh, and the effect is atomization of the society. Because the way that the signaling works, right, uh, protests are rare, and participating in protests gets you imprisoned or into a few days, into after Zaki. So that, that signaling works, but it doesn't work, and it works in a sense of leading people to just um, disconnect and not talk <coughs> about political issues, about grievances, and really sort of um, enfolding into their own little worlds even further. So if depoliticization strategies worked through different means over the past years because of propaganda and the politics is a bad business and you know just just uh, everyone is lying, everyone is corrupt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now um, the, the repressions against those who take an activist position lead to uh, quite extreme forms of atomization of Russian society where you have formerly existing small groupings of people who have studied together, who go to clubs together or any type of little groupings on WhatsApp, on chats, on Telegram channels, they stopped discussing politically important issues. And I've had several conversations myself about how information gets exchanged about Navalny, about, you know, and, and the way that was described to me was, have you heard about Navalny? Yes. Period, silence, that's it. So this silence effect, this deafening effect of violence is what I am observing and find socially quite, of course, depressing because, you know, the disempowered society gets yet further disempowered through this silence and atomization. Thank you. I have massively overextended. I'm very sorry. Um, I shall now open it out to you, ladies and gentlemen, in the audience and online. There's some brilliant questions online. So I will take as many as I possibly can and apologize again at the end. So. Uh, lady, centre, centre, roughly speaking, yes, uh, that's it. Yep, you've got the right one, Eliza, yes, correct. Hi okay. there, I'm Dr. Kristen Nadeau, member of Chatham House Consultant, United States Air Force. Um, we've been talking a lot about how the current government uh, is structured and managing uh, the population and the economy of Russia. I was wondering if the panel could talk a bit about uh, other influences on how Russia is governed, for example, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, okay. uh, their trading partners. Um, what, are the, what role, as, as Russia you know, struggles to maintain logistically their, their supplies, they're going to need to look outside to some extent and how that might influence how Russia is governed? I'll take a couple at a time, if I may. Um, gentlemen, right in the back, middle back, yep. You have your hand up, white, white lanyard, I think. Yep. 
Yeah, I was just wondering um, when the body... Yourself. Can you introduce yourself, please? Sorry. Oh, yes, my name's Nick. Nick Fowl, sorry. And affiliation? Uh, a new member. OK. Uh, essentially. Oh, sorry, well. I'm, I'm new to all this business. It's okay. uh, essentially, when the bodies uh, come home to all the rural areas uh, from uh, Ukraine, will that undermine the support for Putin okay. and change the metric through which they view the regime? Yeah. Thanks. And gentlemen, right at the front here. Sorry to move you around a little bit, Eliza. Just, just here at the front. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, Robert Walter, I'm a former member of parliament and one of the first British politicians uh, to be sanctioned by Russia after the invasion of, uh, U of uh, Crimea. Um, I wanted to ask the panel really about the effectiveness of what we do in, resp in, in respect of e enabling the opposition to, to work in Russia. Um, it, Russia has been kicked out of the Council of Europe. It's still a member of the OSCE, but that's uh, pretty meaningless. Uh, it's a member of the UN Security Council where it can block anything which it doesn't like. Um, but uh, my question really is this, and I, I mean, I was sanctioned because of what I did on sanctions on, on our side, but uh, is, are they counterproductive? A, a Russian uh, politician, senior Russian politician said to me uh, once after I'd been sanctioned uh, that uh, he, he would probably do the same as I did uh, if he was in my position, but he had to tell me that everything I did made Mr. Putin ever more popular. Interesting. I was just on the sanctions question, and the UK is coming out with its own sanctions, um, I don't know whether you want to call it white paper or, or strategy, really, um, and we'll be, we'll be discussing that soon, so we must get, get in touch. Um, uh, I think it's easiest if I, if I let you respond to what you would like to respond to, but we've got here other influences on, on, on Russia, uh, the effects of bodies coming home, and uh, the effectiveness of enabling the opposition and, and sanctions being counterproductive. Cool now, let's go in reverse order. Yeah. Uh, quickly on the bodies coming home depends on where they come to. If there are many bodies that come to big cities, uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, those cities where you have the most active uh, population, uh, then that's a different story. But many bodies and come to rural areas where, and a lot of uh, contract soldiers were uh, driven out of very remote regions where collective action opportunities are very small to non-existent. Uh, and so uh, at this point, uh, it doesn't quite have an effect that it might have uh, uh, in, in different circumstances. So that would be probably the quickest answer. And on the issue of effectiveness of sanctions, um, I would say that there is always an opportunity in the context of sanctions for the country against which sanctions are oriented to, for the government of that country to, to build the patriotic um, line and, and to, to have a more positive spin that it allows for import substitution and that of course it proves that the West are the enemies that want Russia's end and fragmentation. But uh, in the end, the sanctions are uh, directed at undermining Russian economy in the longer term. I know the intention was for a more short term, but um, I think now the thinking is evolving that in the longer term, in terms of technological um, advancement and developmental opportunities for Russia, that's where the sanctions come in. They will not allow uh, Russia to, to think in developmental terms of taking economy somewhere into a new place that the, Rus that the Kremlin was promising and thinking about before the war started. You can answer what you wish, but I, but I noticed the first part of Robert's question was about the effectiveness of enabling the opposition. That's very much what we're trying to achieve with your research here. Yeah, can I just uh, quickly say uh, about the answer the next questions about uh, bodies coming as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think that Gunnar's made a good point about that the attitude is different um, in Russian regions and in cities, so that this uh, money, that so-called grabavuye, yeah, the, the kind of money for funeral is actually, I don't know, also some kind of provide some kind of help and in, in some sense a social lift for some of the families, which is obviously not a good thing to know. But at the same time, um, we see now from this very little opinion poll that we have that people in Russian regions, uh, there is a growing number of those who are actually 
not in favour of so-called special military operation and they are more in favour of actually moving to some peace talks, uh, meaning that these people affected by the economic situation um, to a bigger extent, but at the same time, because they probably see more coffins coming back to the to the villages. And also, I think the the the, the other thing um, that is also scary is not the that the body is coming back, but it's also that the people uh, from the war are coming back because we are now seeing many stories in Russian media about the person going to prison, like committing crime, going to prison, signing a contract with military of defense, or let's say Wagner, as it was in the past, um, serving their six months, coming back to the villages, kill again, go into prison, and it's going on and on and on. And so I feel like this is one of the things that Putin probably doesn't want to deal with um, this year and the next years, uh, basically to solve these problems of this combatant man. Um, so yeah, I feel like this is this is might have been even the, the even the bigger issue that, that the coffins are coming. I'm afraid, Maxim, you've been left with a question of other influences on the Russian government. But, I mean, the question was um, mentioned was the Russian Orthodox Church as an example. But what else? Uh, well, I'm myself an expert. Actually, uh, my focus is propaganda, so <laughs> um, I don't can't say much about uh, other external influences. So, Orthodox Church is obviously important, right? So, at some point, uh, it is a power which uh, legit legitimizes the Russian government, and the, the Church sort of engages in the in the war, right? So, uh, you see. Uh, people from the church uh, participating in the war. Uh, you see that at the public uh, symbolical level, uh, yeah, so they, they do definitely uh, try to uh, uh, mobilize their communities, religious communities, to um, shape perceptions of the war and to, to an extent mobilize resources to uh, donate, to uh, buy drones and, and stuff like that. Uh, so definitely the regime has been trying to exploit this existing leverage, right, so the uh, religious sentiment of some part of Russian population. Uh, yeah, I don't know, what, what else can I say about other uh, influences? On trading partners, yeah. of course, the role of China, partners, yeah. India, Turkey, uh, United Arab Emirates uh, for the money to come in, Chinese cars replacing all the Western cars and becoming the biggest, Russia becoming sort of a really big market for Chinese cars. Those links are incredibly important, therefore China's position uh, is really important, uh, and, and that strategy of um, you know, ca uh, sort of catering and developing uh, good relationships is, uh, is, is key to Russia's medium-term economic and social survival. Yeah, yeah just mm -hmm. a yeah. quick addition. So I think that uh, it sort of works to an extent uh, uh, and it helps to an extent sustain military production. So you see that they rely on these partners on Iran and China. Uh, but for instance, if I look at uh, data about the population, how people, uh, you know, think about what Russians call substitution, import substitution, uh, whether it actually uh, developed enough and whether they feel the effects of uh, import substitution in their lives, obviously it's it's not enough, right? So probably they can rely on these external partners to compensate military production to an extent, but it does not really translate into population level. So uh, people complain about, you know, uh, instead of having, having import substitute, uh, they just uh, don't have enough goods, so it doesn't work for the civil. It uh, may translate to the popular level, but it does seem to me that the war economy is driving a war now, and if Putin was to turn it off, then Russia would be in a lot of trouble. So he can't turn it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's two. Yes, Julia. Sorry, absolutely. Yeah, can I uh, make a point about the about the sanctions? I feel yes. kind of left out on that. Uh, so I have to say that um, I cannot talk about what kind of sanctions should be implemented against Russia, because being a Russian citizen and advocating for sanctions can turn into a criminal case for me. So <laughs> I prefer not to say that, um, if I may. But just to mention, uh, like after the death of Navalny, this, the sanctions that were seen uh, from the UK is sanctioning the, the prison bosses that I'm not sure, like, and. and freezing their assets in the UK. Like, first of all, I'm not sure they've ever been to, UK, to the UK and have any kind of assets and probably won't be even given a visa to travel. And so those sanctions looked a bit, um, I don't know, important, maybe a bit pathetic as well. Um, <laughs> in, terms of, uh, in terms of the help, uh, I feel like the Germany is uh, giving a good example of how to support 
Russian um, anti-war grassroots initiatives. And unfortunately, this is what uh, my this is the topic of my research. Unfortunately, what I'm seeing is that UK doesn't do much in this front. Uh, because the horizontal links between those grassroots initiatives, they're very strong, and it's now really important to, to focus on them and support them. And because they are, in fact, they are kind of laying the foundation of Russian civil society, and uh, they are basically the minimum infrastructure that those in exile and those are inside Russia uh, rely on at the moment. So, and unfortunately, most of this project, they're very underfunded and they're very in a very difficult financial situation, and they really need the support from uh, the international community. And uh, no, they will not make, I don't know, they will not overthrow Putin, right? Uh, but they are essentially just fulfilling the roles of institutions that we don't have in Russia that are actually protecting the rights and freedoms of Russians. So I feel, yeah, that their importance should, shouldn't be overlooked or underestimated. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a couple online, uh, if I may, to a couple of very enticing questions. First of all, uh, and it may be back to you, but of course anyone can answer it. Um, Yulia. Um, <clears throat> Salem Adil Abdel Munem writes, basically he is saying that Putin is afraid of his elites. But, and it might, he's asking, you know, but, but um, will, it, will it create, a, a, in his creation of a new elite, does that allow for possibilities of a coup? So he's uh, saying, in the conditions of international iso isolation, Putin is actually afraid of those around him. So just, I'll leave it out there and you can, uh, think about that one. Um, and then Yehor Brelan and Stephen Hall have asked a very similar question. It's this, how should the West react to Putin's election? Very interesting question. Yeah, normally, of course, as congratulations are far. Well, how should, what should they say? So, whilst they're both very difficult questions, but um, Yulia, is, do, you, do you think it's a credible theory that Putin is afraid of his own elite? Um. It depends who we're taking for elite, right? Because there are different kinds of yep. elite. There are, as we usually talk about Russian politics, we usually mention some kind of bureaucrats and technocrats, let's say, yeah, let's put it this way. Uh, to, be, to be honest, my position, um, I'm not sure that he actually is afraid of his elites mm -hmm. because um, he can always substitute the existing elite with a new elite and not to be afraid of them, if, if, if put in it shortly. But if we're talking about, about going a bit deeper about this technocrats and um, bureaucrats that say that basically just turn into something like, let's say, peace party and, and the war party, uh, technocrats, they just prefer, I feel like they just prefer not to read the news, not to talk about, like, not to express their opinion about uh, what's going on in Ukraine and going in the country. They just basically turned into some kind of keepers and maintainers of the regime. And obviously they have, they cannot even quit their job, right? Because they are just terrified. Uh, so I feel like they are just trying, they're just living, they're just living one day basically. They do not know what's going what to happen tomorrow because uh, they're so distanced from, from Putin now. So after COVID started, there is not many direct communication with the Russian leader. So people just kind of second guessing. And in terms of uh, those bureaucrats or war party, um, I feel like they feel more comfortable because they have a clearer vision of what political steps should be done, uh, where the country uh, should be moving in which direction. And I feel like it's just because they frame their reasoning to Putin in a geopolitical rather than economic categories. It just occupies Putin more. That's why they have like a closer access to him. And at the same time, they have just opportunity to carry favor and increase their yeah, influence. Okay. Maxime, two weeks today, say, what should Western leaders say and do? Uh, I don't think that 
I don't really think that you can do much, right? Because uh, uh, the election right now, uh, they have different functions. Uh, before that, uh, one of the functions was to legitimize Russia, Russia's political system in the eyes of external Western observers. Uh, it's no longer sort of a function, right? So we know that, uh, especially in the West, people do not really consider it as a, as a legitimate institution. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's mostly for internal purposes, for legitimizing the power in the eyes of the people, and also for disciplining elites, right? So for showing that you are in full control, you can run such a large-scale operation uh, without any uh, problems. So in the sense, you can't do much, so uh, you might sort of, uh, maybe it's worth not considering this election a legitimate election, because again, according to Western standards, it's not a legitimate election. There will be no external observers, uh, so there is a, a reason to not consider them legitimate, but it will not have a, a much uh, impact on, on the Russian system. Uh, yeah. Yulia is not in agreement, but Gulnaz, what do you think? We should remember uh, what was the Western reaction to Soviet elections. <laughs> mm -hmm. why, why should we call it elections? Yeah. yeah. Yevgeny Albats always admonished me here in this building, in this room, I think, saying, why do you call it an election, James? It's not an election as we know it. But I've had this discussion with Kolya Petrov and with Ben Noble, who say, look, there are different kinds of elections. So maybe we can, we can argue a point. It might be so. Uh, go back to a room. There was a gentleman in a blue shirt behind Arisia, actually. Give more or less behind Arisia. Oh, yeah. um, just, just take the microphone, please, and introduce yourself. Good evening. Um, so I'm Harry Williams. I work for ORB International, um, and we do primary research in, in Russia. So we ran some focus groups recently and gently probed on the, on the elections. Um, and we found, you know, people going through the motions. They're not really engaging in the process, which I guess, you know, hammers home the, the point that they're not really elections. But I guess what I want to know is from an internal perspective, how, how is that managed to ensure that they're still legitimate if there's disengagement? Uh, and how important is it to manage that they're legitimate? OK, understood. Uh, let me see. Uh, lady here on the right, please, yeah, in the scarf, the lanyard, yeah. Hi, my name is Isabel Taylor from EBRD. And I have a question. What sort of grievance mechanisms do you see available to the Russian people that are not in favor of the regime? OK, interesting. And yeah, gentlemen at the front, right in front of me here, red tie, blue shirt. Right, yeah, just middle, middle, yeah. Hi, uh, Henry Jones, an associate director at Highgate, a strategic advisory firm. Um, much was made of uh, Navalny's return to Russia following his treatment in Germany. Um, and off the context of the kind of use of violence that we've discussed in this panel, how, from a practical point of view, how viable is it to mount a, an effective opposition campaign remotely, i.e. from outside Russia, from the relative safety, I'm going to use in inverted commas, thinking of the Skripals, but how viable is it to do that effectively from a, a safe-ish third country in terms of information dissemination, media, campaigning? Can it be done? Thank you, Henry. Yes, that question also came in online <clears throat> as well. OK, let's take that one to you first, Julia, if I may. How viable is an, a, an effective opposition campaign remotely from abroad? Whew, that's actually really hard to say. And I feel like this is the war uh, puzzles uh, the Russian opposition these days. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, because um, let's say, I don't know, if we take um, so until, until the war started, until Navalny went to prison, I would say that uh, Navalny's team and uh, anti-corruption foundation of Navalny, FBK, was kind of the main opposition power. Uh, but they were not so, but, but Navalny was kind of wearing, you know, kind of many hats. He, he wasn't only um, a politician that is participated in like electoral cycle, let's say, as he tried to do in 2018 and did in 2013. Um, he was also doing investigations, mm -hmm. uh, so being a blogger and be doing investigations. And the other leg uh, was kind of organizing the street protests. So I feel like this, these three things made Navalny successful, so not only like, you know, the political direction. Um, now we see that, like, I don't know, to my opinion, um, anti-corruption foundation, Navalny team, for the last two years, they've been in a bit of a of a crisis uh, because they only publish in investigations. They cannot do the other two legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I feel this is very tricky. And, and 
Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have an answer to that, to be <coughs> honest, because they are not able, like, you cannot only do investigation and then expect people to, I don't mm. know, to go on the streets as it was with um, investigation about Dmitry Medvedev, let's say. Yeah. Interesting. It'll be fascinating to see how how they managed to, to continue. and Because it seems to me that Navalny's organization was superb at organization, and that's one thing. But on the other hand, they did very much rely on that, that central figure there. So I'm not quite sure which way that'll go. Maxime, can I ask you the, the legitimacy question? I mean, I'm not, you, might, you might dispute the premise of the question, but the question was, just to remind, how do they ensure legitimacy, which is weird in an illegitimate election, but there you go. Uh, given the given little interest, right, so yeah. in disengagement, uh, I think you mentioned focus groups, and yeah. I, I just remember uh, some colleagues of mine ran focus groups a couple of months ago, and there was a question about election, and there was this very funny discussion when there were like five participants, and the moderator asks people uh, what they think about the upcoming election, and the first one says, uh, I don't really care much, uh, you know, it will not make any difference, and the second one says, oh, I completely forgot about uh, the fact that we are having election this year, yeah. and the th third per person says, I'm very much interested in Russian elections, uh, in elections happening in the US, so I really <laughs> want them to remove Biden. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a funny story, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, there is a sense what, what I see in, in reactions uh, in data and uh, during interviews, focus groups, is the sense of sort of forced uh, consensus in a sense. It's like, uh, I know this is wrong, that this person is running for like fifth time or something, uh, but at this point, we have a war uh, and all this crisis, uh, and I know that it's a, it's a foregone conclusion, uh, but I don't see any other alternatives, so probably it's like the best uh, possible option because we don't have any alternatives and there's this forced feeling and sense of crisis. Uh, so it's like I don't have a choice, but I also uh, justify not having a choice for myself, for myself but to, by referring to the circumstances of war and crisis. Uh, so in the sense that it's, it becomes a little bit more legitimate when uh, you can find uh, justifications. Thank you. Gulnaz, bad luck. This leaves you with the grievance question. What grievance mechanisms are open still? I'm, I'm going to connect a few questions. Great. So um, there are not many grievance uh, expression mechanisms available uh, to those who are not happy and who have an active position. And the fact that the Kremlin has left the door open, so to say, to leave, and those who left were able to leave was probably the number one mechanism available, right? Now, having said that, I will move to the issue of um, effective opposition strategies and link it to the grievance mechanism as well. Because the opposition that is outside the country, the war is the best political strategy to delegitimize any opposition that is abroad. And so in terms of effectiveness, there is this catch-22 that the Russian opposition outside of the country faces of having very hard time, very minimal influence uh, onto people who live inside. However, do they have an alternative? And how can we think about this issue in the absence of any alternatives? And in the absence of any alternatives, and we also know that the 1.3 million or whatever hundred thousands that have left are, do not take up all Russians who are anti-regime. There are many people who are anti-regime in Russia. So for the opposition to sort of give up and not do anything and not reach out to these people, not engage with them, not to try to talk to them, not to try to engage, not to try to use certain resources that are inside Russia would be uh, a damning effect on any um, anti-regime people inside. So the opposition that is outside could be also seen as one potential grievance mechanism and mechanism for some sort of active doing of something for those anti-regime inside Russia as well. So I think those linkages are very important. And in the absence of alternatives, the conversation about the ineffectiveness or impossibility of effective opposition is really um, a bit disruptive. Thank you, Gulnaz. It strikes me that we, we, Russia is nothing if not contradictory. We know from, say, Jane McGlynn's research, for example, that Russia, the Russian people are complicit. There is a great deal of, whether it's Stockholm Syndrome or absolute nationalism, there's a lot of support for the war. But at the same time, we also know that the war is not popular in certain areas, and it's very, it does present us with a confusing picture. Ladies and gents, um, 
they dock my salary if I go on too long. So um, uh, I think I better keep it, um, cl uh, keep clipping it to a close right there. This is how we deal with the Russian elections in, uh, in Chatham House with appropriate skepticism, um, but a lot of analysis, uh, not least from, from Russians, as I say, themselves. But please join me in thanking the panel this evening. Thank you.